This episode of Geared Up is brought to you by National Car Rental. Take control of your travel experience with National Car Rental's Emerald Club. Visit nationalcar.com to find out more. Elon was acting strange on stage. It seemed like he was acting coy and like something had happened backstage or I don't know, maybe too many drinks. Um, <laughs> but you get that same Is sense he too? always kind of like awkward, though. He always seems to yeah. be. This seemed awkward. weirder, weirder than awkward. Am I reading too much into that, Ben? To me, he had an essence of kind of confidence when he came out compared to his usual mumbling, get through the slides <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> Because he came out and it was like rock star status, you know, Grimes with the hologram yeah. intro. I feel like he was maybe feeling himself a little bit when he came out. And and then maybe that switched real quick. I don't know. It, it was definitely a different Elon. I don't know if it was being coy or not, but but definitely yeah. different than normal. Yeah. It was just a weird vibe. And so I kept waiting for the big reveal of like, oh, this is a joke. Like, here's the real one. And then when the, the windows cracked and then I was like, oh, that, mu- that must have been what was supposed to happen. Uh, right. And then they're going to bring up the real truck. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, we have an ATV, but we're not going to talk about it. And then he didn't really talk anything about the specs of the car, which is on the screen behind him. It was all very strange. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am still John Rettinger. As always, you are John Rettinger. And this week, still big news in the tech industry, in the automobile industry. Giant news. Tesla announced a new truck. And to celebrate that... We have our third special guest ever, Mr. Ben Sullen. What's happening, Yay! y'all? Clap for how Ben. How are you guys doing, man? Ben, how you doing? Oh, still, you know, recovering from last night, but uh, but grinding through it here. Yeah. So excited to be with you guys. So as the two that were there at the event, and we got to witness this this life changing <laughs> once in a lifetime tech history, something you'll remember your whole <laughs> life. And for those of you that weren't there, like my co- like my co host, yeah, you know, would you think that maybe it's just like it's it's all downhill from here? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, that's it. You know, this was the peak. <laughs> this is Elon's finest work. You know, yeah, that's it, man. I mean, I'm I'm never going to another Tesla event, basically. I mean, like it, that, it, I it can't. Does. <laughs> Giving you, giving you a hard time, Andrew. Wow. You know what? I need to give a shout out to Ben. My co-host, John, has been telling me I'm going to miss out on the annals of time. <laughs> but he, he's correct. He's right. I will never forget that phrase, by the way, John. I will never forget that. But Ben tried to get me in. He failed, but he made the attempt. I tried. I tried. So I appreciate that, Ben. But before we get into the news, just tell people, tell the listeners who you are. Why are you the right person? Why did we make the right choice? Which we did <laughs> to bring you in for the episode about a new Tesla vehicle. Yeah. So I host a YouTube channel called Teslanomics and I focus basically on really electric vehicles now because there are actually some legit ones coming out. But mm-hmm. for the past three years, basically nothing but Tesla stuff. And I've been kind of in the weeds of it for a while. So yeah, I was at the event along with John and a bunch of other really really cool, lovely people. And yeah, you know, so I guess I've been around the Tesla world a while and, uh, you know, I, I guess I probably have a unique perspective on it from that regard. But John, I think you've actually been a, a Tesla owner longer than I have, right? You've been with it for a while, I think. Yeah. So this is just wrapping up year six, actually, of Tesla ownership. I had a uh, the original pre-autopilot Model S Okay, and then my uh, three years with a... Oh, uh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Three years with a 75D Model X, that'll be going back in a few weeks. Oh, right, because your lease is up or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I've had the model, I had a what I like to refer lovingly to as the driver's edition, the pre-autopilot version as well, Model S, then we got a Model 3, and then so me and my wife both had Teslas at the point, and then I sold the Model S and now have a P90D Model X that I drive as my daily driver. You know, I've got a Model Y coming. I've got two Roadsters that I earned through the referral program, which still blows my mind. I did not order a truck last night, but, you know, so, yeah, I've been, I don't know. I've been in every Tesla and tested them inside and out. So I guess I have a, a good amount of experience here with them. So maybe that's that's why I'm a good choice here to talk about the truck. That's why. So, yes, if you don't know Ben, check him out on YouTube. And I can verify the two Roadsters. I saw it on his phone yesterday. <laughs> uh, they are there and uh, they exist. Yeah. And they will exist uh, in his driveway very soon. Yeah, I don't know when those are coming out, but yeah. All right, so let's let's jump into this news. Tesla, can I say Tesla? Is that okay? Can I say Tesla with Ben on the show? <laughs> can I pronounce it that way? Well, if you want to follow Elon's lead and you know and say it how he does and Franz does and everyone else, you know, you need that hard Z sound yeah. in there. So it's Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Tesla, the Tesla. Yeah. 
Cybertruck. We've been waiting for it for, I think, three years, three or four years since they first mentioned it. It's finally here. It was announced last night. You guys were there. I was watching on the live stream on YouTube. Now, John said he wanted me to give my thoughts first. I wasn't even there, John. I'm curious. So, I so Ben and I were there. We saw the truck in person, but most people who yes. are going to order this and pre-order it never saw the truck in person, right? For sure. They'll see pictures, they'll see videos, but they'll probably never see it in person yeah. until they order and then you know, have theirs where they really start showing up in their neighborhoods. So I'm curious what it looked like, what the event looked like from those watching on the live stream. Okay. Because it was a different experience, I think, being there live. Sure, sure. So I was watching, obviously, from home. I was watching it on a TV so I you know, could actually see it instead of watching it on my phone. And as soon as they drove the car out, initially for like the first, I don't know, 10 seconds, I was super confused. Like, what? What is this? Like, is this? <laughs> I actually thought it was going to, it was being driven out the way it looked. And then like, it was covered by something and that covering was going to be removed to reveal the actual, what it looked like. And then, you know, pretty quickly when they started getting out of the car, you were like, oh wait, that's, that is the truck. That's what it looks like. (laughs) Okay. And so I went from confusion to, it was almost like when you have to like admit something to yourself, you go through those different stages of grief and then acceptance. (laughs) So first it was confusion. Then it was, "Mm, that's, that's kind of weird. I don't know what they're doing. And then like over time, as I was looking at it, I was like, there's nothing else on the road like that. And I went from, I'm not sure about this, to a mindset of, if you're going to change an industry, you can't do the same thing that everyone else does. Whether it's from the inside, from the outside, from the feature, like if you really want to shake something up, you have to come at it with a different idea, a new idea, a fresh approach. And that's exactly what I saw on that stage last night. And so going through everything, except for when they destroyed the windows, which was weird. Um, (laughs) Besides that, everything leading up to the price, I was like, okay, this is super cool. Everything's cool. I was personally thinking like I remembered a couple of years ago or maybe it was a year ago when they said like it should cost around 50. Mm -hmm. And as they were showing it off, I was like, there's no way this is going to be 50. This is going to be an expensive truck. And then they they put the price on the screen and instantly I was sold. So as soon as it went up for pre-order, I put down the hundred dollars. I don't know why it used to be 5,000 bucks. Now it's like a hundred dollars. So I put my hundred dollars down for sure. And I will be rolling around the neighborhood looking like master chief in halo. <laughs> Man, I wonder, well, you guys go ahead, but I, I have a lot of thoughts on that hundred dollars thing as well. Well, before we get to that, I want to hear from you guys. Like you guys were there. First of all, what I want to know, I mean, tell me about your thoughts on the truck and your thought process when you saw it. But also, how was the feeling in the room when those windows shattered? Because I'm super curious, like inside the room that had to be weird. Ben, you have at it. Yeah. John, I don't know where you were standing. You were in the press thing, right? And kind of the bleachers there. Yeah. Yeah, I had a pretty good angle to see it. And I didn't actually hear it until later because I, I put a, that clip in my video that I just published last night or this morning, I guess. And Elon cussed when it happened. Yes. And I was standing next to an engineer that worked on the truck and was like, that was the 50th time we've done that. And that's why it happened. Wow. Uh, that's why it broke. He, he said, we've been doing this all night. He said, behind that wall, there's a bunch of F-150s shot up with bullet holes. Like, we've been <laughs> trying to destroy this thing for months. And it just happened that that was it. And then if you caught it, Franz, it was like, oh, let's try the back window too. And uh, Elon's like, "Uh, I'm not sure if we should. uh," And he's like, oh, okay, there it goes, I guess. (laughs) I think it was complete. It sucked the wind out of it, I think. And it changed. I mean, that was like everyone looking around like was that supposed didn't they just show it not break like what's right it was just complete confusion and just to me sucked the wind out of the room yeah because from that point on elon was standing in front of the truck with shattered windows for the whole rest (laughs) of the presentation so all pictures and video at that point was with a damaged vehicle behind him yeah ben do you agree here i felt like there was supposed to be much more to that event that ended up happening yes and it seemed like it was just cut short and they're like see ya uh huh, a hundred percent. So, so the information I got from people talking, you know, from talking with people at Tesla that were rehearsing the presentation, they were supposed to bring out a chainsaw. There may have been a blowtorch that was supposed to what? come out. Yeah. So they were basically going to just try to destroy that thing, as you saw them with the sledgehammer and then with the uh, the steel balls. But after that, 
I think, you know, Elon called an audible and was like, we're done here, guys. Let's, yeah. let's get this. And then of course it's like, let's go do test drives. Oh, but by the way, you got to go fix the glass first. <laughs> Cause that was the only one they had. So ooh, like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you recover from that. Like you guys are old school tech heads. I don't remember watching this live, but earlier in, in my tech career, one of the funniest memes was Bill Gates on stage demoing Windows 95. Oh, yeah. And they plugged in the print with the plug and play. Like, you don't need to install drivers. You just do this. <laughs> Bink, blue screen of death. And it's like, oh. <laughs> but then, of course, Windows 95 sold, you know, I don't know, billions of copies worldwide. Like, it changed right. computing. So, you know, despite the demo, I kind of feel like it's not a real demo until something goes wrong. And <laughs> fair enough. I don't know how it could go more spectacularly wrong than that. Yeah, it went sideways. And I don't know, Ben, did you have the impression too, when they first rolled that truck out, do you think it was a joke? If they're like, ha ha ha, here's a real one, like the real yeah. one's coming? Yeah, I thought, I thought it was going to be, here was our initial design. Yeah, that, and that's what then, I thought too. And then another one was going to come and be like, here's, you know, our second iteration. And then finally, Here's the real one. Now, I've seen some renderings online of people mocking this up where basically all they did was cut off the, they're called sail pillars, the like triangles yeah. at the back that cover the bed, mm -hmm. uh, where they just cut that off and gave it more of a, like an end to the back of the cab. And I mean, compared to what it is now, I think it looks infinitely better. Agreed. And I think more truck people would probably see that and be like, oh yeah, like crazy futuristic, et cetera, et cetera. Look at these specs, look at this price. The value is there in terms of what it can do. And yeah, it's futuristic, but it still looks reasonable to me. I think with those sail pillars, they call the kind of back triangle side, man, I have a hard time imagining your typical F-150 owner, you know, working at a job site, being comfortable driving that. I, I think the design is probably too difficult for people to get over that are in that kind of truck yeah. owner space. Is that why you haven't reserved one? No, I wasn't going to reserve one anyways. I've got a Model X. I've got a Model 3. We've got a Model Y in order. I also have a 99 Tacoma, just an old beat up truck. You know, I live in San Diego, so I go surf a lot. That was like the perfect run to Home Depot. You know, yeah. I own a house, so you, you know, mm -hmm. owning a house, you have to like go, like you need a truck once in a while, not all the time, but that thing just sits there and there's spider webs all over it. Like I don't really need a truck whatsoever. So to me, you know, it's funny. I did, you guys know Zach, Jerry Rig, everything. And he ordered one and he sent me a screenshot of the order confirmation. And I sent it to my wife and she just lost it. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, no, how could you? It's so, and I'm like, I, it's for the channel. I got to do it. This That's is my awesome. job. But no, no, I, I wasn't going to order one anyways. This is why I also sold my Model S. Like I had my Model S and at the time I had all three models. It was really cool to like see them side by side for videos and things. I could have totally justified keeping them, but I just, I don't know, maybe I'm a wannabe minimalist and I'm like, I don't need three <laughs> cars. I live in a normal suburban neighborhood. I don't need like five Teslas just on the streets, <laughs> you know? So it's just, right. it, it was over. I wasn't going to do it anyways. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, I mean, this is... I would actually love to have one just to make videos with and have fun with, but I don't know. And it actually, I mean, after getting a ride in it, like John, did you end up getting a, a test ride? I didn't actually. Oh, okay. Well, it, it was a fantastic ride. Like I actually really love the interior and a lot of the stuff they're doing, you know, they have a new OS that they were using and the screen was bigger and different. Like there was a lot of really yes, great things. Like, I would probably really enjoy screen. that. Yeah. 17 inch landscape mode, kind of like the model three, but bigger. Why did it have a Roadster steering wheel? That seems odd to me. <laughs> yes, it does. I don't know. Maybe they'll change that before it actually comes to production. I hope they will. But but yeah, point being, it just wasn't right. And so as much as I would love to have one, yeah, I didn't order one. Now, someone who did order one, I mentioned earlier, I ordered one once it was over. But John, you ordered one too. Yeah. So I'm going to apologize in advance here. I have a lot of thoughts. So I'm going to feel free to jump in and interrupt me here. We want to hear them. Before you give your thoughts, okay. let me just take our commercial break. All right. And then when we come back, it'll be John has the floor. How about that? And it's controversial. So there's, there's your tease, right. Ooh, tease to stick around. There's the teaser. All right. Yes. Yeah, so we'll be right back with Geared Up with John's controversial thoughts on the Tesla Cybertruck. Big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring this week's episode of Geared Up. Every road warrior knows technology can make or break a business trip, but that's not the only way to stay in control of your travel experience. 
Join National Car Rentals Emerald Club and you can bypass the counter, choose any car on the aisle and go. That's less time worrying and more time to use your phone to tune in to the Geared Up podcast. Go national, go like a pro. Subject to availability and other restrictions. Welcome back to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental story of the week. As you know, Geared Up is sponsored by National Car Rental. And if you don't know, I also do a show with National Car Rental on YouTube called Technically Speaking, where I bring you the latest, my picks for the best tech for business travel. Whether you're business traveling or even whether you're going for leisure travel, there's a lot of tech out there that can make your travel more efficient or even more fun. You can check these episodes out at the nationalcar.com control center or go to youtube.com slash national car rent. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. And once again, big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. All right, John, you teased us. Feel free to jump in and uh, interrupt me at any time. So I'm not a truck guy in the sense like I own a lot of trucks. I've never owned a truck, but I'm a truck guy in the sense that I really want one for no apparent reason. I mean, to the point where I was test driving Ram 1500s after driving electric for six years. And my wife told me if I bought a gas guzzling truck, she's going to send me to therapy to see what was going on and what was wrong in my life. (laughs) So I, I, I was obviously very excited for the Tesla truck. In fact, my next car, the Model 3, I'm doing a two-year lease on. So I could time it pretty close to the release of what the Tesla truck was going to be. And then when the Rivian, Mm -hmm. presumably, is uh, mass-produced and the F-150 is out. So I'm very truck-focused here. When they rolled this thing out, I thought it was a joke. It looked like a joke. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like it was the real truck. And then Elon was acting strange on stage. It seemed like he was acting coy and like something had happened backstage or I don't know, maybe too many drinks. Um, but did you get that same <laughs> sense too? He always kind of like awkward though. He always seems to yeah. be. This seemed awkward. weirder, weirder than awkward. Am I reading too much into that, Ben? To me, he had an essence of kind of confidence when he came out compared to his usual mumbling, get through the slides <laughs> yeah. stuff. Because he came out and it was like rock star status, you know, Grimes with the hologram yeah. intro. I feel like he was maybe feeling himself a little bit when he came out. And and then maybe that switched real quick. I don't know. It, it was definitely a different Elon. I don't know if it was being coy or not, but but definitely yeah. different than normal. Yeah. It was just a weird vibe. And so I kept waiting for the big reveal of like, oh, this is a joke. Like, here's the real one. And then when the, the windows cracked and then I was like, oh, that, that must have been what was supposed to happen. Uh, right. And then they're going to bring up the real truck. <laughs> And then they're like, oh, we have an ATV, but we're not going to talk about it. And then he didn't really talk anything about the specs of the car, which is on the screen behind him. It was all very strange. The design is very weird. And this is sort of where my controversial part comes in. So as a bit of background for folks that are new to the show, the number one selling car in America for 35 years running is a Ford F-150. 35 years running. And depending on the Still year, the number, two, the number two car is either the Ram 1500 or the Chevy Silverado. Those go back and forth, two and three. If you break down the math, there is a Ford F-Series truck sold every 30 seconds in America. <laughs> wow. Jeez. Tesla and Elon have stated that their mission statement is to speed up the development of sustainable energy and sustainable transportation. That's sort of been a, a paraphrased version of their mission statement. Let me interrupt you real quick, John, because yes, I remember, I think you said this in a video too. You're right about all those stats, and I actually had them all pulled up for my video. didn't include any of them, but the market is different than just those three vehicles. So have you looked at the segments and the percentage of sales? Yes. Because crossovers are like almost 40%. Correct. And pickups are like 17% overall. Correct. So it's kind of Hmm. like the individual vehicles sell a ton, like over 900,000 F-Series Fords. But overall, people buy more crossovers, like more than double they do pickups. But pickups are still a big American thing. Absolutely. The, the point was to show the demand for a truck is there. Sure. And it appears to be unsatiated just by the number that sell every year. Right. So what I don't understand with Tesla, if Tesla was a private company, meaning they could do what they want, they weren't beholden to shareholders, I would understand the Cybertruck more, I think. Mm-hmm. Say, okay, here's a smack to the auto industry. Here is a different design of a truck. We put the industry on its head. Now it's up to the other manufacturers to try to do something new, compete with us, rethink the truck. This is probably not going to be a high volume vehicle. We know the looks are going to be polarizing. Let's see what you can do. But Tesla is a publicly traded company. They're beholden to their shareholders. If this is a miss, if in two years there's a bunch of other options out there and people are like, I don't want to drive that weird ass car, this is going to hurt the bottom line. 
Mm-hmm. Mm. I mean, this is going to severely hurt the company. And if their mission is to speed up the adoption of sustainable energy, it seems odd to make a truck that's as polarizing. Now, I know Elon has said if people don't like it, maybe they'll just make another truck that people like. <laughs> yes, that, kind of stuff. that takes years, that <laughs> takes time, that takes a lot of money. If I was a Tesla shareholder, as we saw by the stock dropping 5% today, I would be pissed. Mm-hmm. As a fan of cars and a fan of Tesla, I'm super excited. But I think what they did is for a company that's financial future has always been on shaky ground. I think they put it on even shakier ground yesterday. Well, I 100% agree with you. In fact, when Elon talked about this on, was it Twitter or a podcast where he first basically was saying, I don't care if people don't like it. I love it, et cetera, et cetera. I remember thinking, Elon, you have enough money and a factory and a team. Just make your wildest dream car. Go ahead. But as as, (laughs) just make one. Yeah, just dude, whatever you want, literally, you can just think it up and send an email and I guarantee it's going to happen, right? Like that's the kind of power this guy has. But for the rest of the world and for exactly all the reasons you just stated, John, do something that is going to to sell and to actually change that market. I don't know if it's going to hurt them as much because, you know, they only are going to make them like to order. So it's not like they're going to make 500,000 of these and be like, oh, Mm. crap, we can't sell them. But it's going to maybe take the shine off of the Tesla brand a little bit. And yeah. and I think in the truck space with Rivian already out there and with presumably a, an electric F-150 coming out next year or being unveiled next year, I think the door is wide open for the electric truck market. I don't think this is going to put like the fact that he teed it up as a game changing, industry changing thing and then delivered a totally fringe, wild, out of this, you know, not mainstream thing. Yeah. That I think is where the big swing and a miss was. You know, if he said, this is crazy wild, nobody's going to buy it. Here it is. Oh, we'll make a really dope normal one next year. (laughs) I think that message would have rang true, you know, but it seems, I agree with you, like bad move, probably not going to help them in the long run. Yeah. Another thing that was interesting, which I think deserves discussion. So the longest range version of this is 500 miles. At least in theory, obviously, it's all on paper. We don't know the battery capacity or anything here at all. But if we're looking at at ranges, and the the smallest range is 250, and this car is clearly made of stainless steel and and obviously much heavier than Tesla's current flock of cars. We can can probably agree that that's true, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So that pack in a 250-mile car has to be at minimum, that car that starts at 39,900 has to be at minimum 100 kilowatt hour pack, correct? Yeah, I would agree with that. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the current cheapest way to get a 100 kilowatt hour pack is a Model S at, I believe, $80,000. Mm-hmm. That's right. So I think what this is showing in two years time, they've gotten the price per kilowatt hour way down. Yes. We can expect either severely discounted or less expensive same size packs or same priced much, much, much larger packs here. Yeah. Which I think is pretty exciting for the next few years of Tesla, I think is where the real advantage is going to be when the competitors start coming out with their with their cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. And, and there's another angle that may also, because we don't know the details on that, right? Because the presentation got cut short. But the other thing I've been hearing and talking with people about is that possibly the Maxwell acquisition that Tesla just completed recently, one of the products Maxwell was working on was a dry electrode battery. And in theory, this battery would fit essentially in the same cylindrical cells, like the same size of cell, but weigh half as much. Interesting. Wow. So imagine if your battery pack just weighed half as much, it had the same energy you maybe don't need a 100 kilowatt hour pack. Sure. But I, th- I think it's probably all these things working in unison where it's getting cheaper for them to do it. Maybe they're getting access to more lithium resources or something. They have Maxwell now, maybe some of the advancements that they're doing there. Tesla's relationship with Panasonic is kind of up in the air and they hired a team of people to start working on their own battery cells. Yeah. So I think that there's probably like a nexus of several different things all pointed in that direction, right? Kind of like yeah. how hard drives got exponentially bigger and files also got smaller at the same time. It was like unlimited storage all of a sudden, right? So I wonder if it's probably a lot of things. Yeah, is that technology from Maxwell? That's a different technology than solid state, correct? Correct, yeah. A dry electrode is not a solid state battery. Solid state is still out there, you know? And ironically, John B. Goodenough, the guy that invented the lithium ion battery at 97 years old, is the one that is still pushing forward here and may have something that would work. I mean, the reason we don't have it is because developing a battery that sits inside of a lab 
and does what it's supposed to do is one thing. Putting it into a car that gets into a wreck at 80 miles per hour is a different thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mass market producing of it's just like, you know, it's a different animal to try to bring something to market than just to make it technically possible. So I think I think solid state will come, but I don't think that's where Tesla's at right now. I agree. And Benson, Henrik Fisker's been saying every car he's been showing us for the past three years is solid state <laughs> and 400 miles and recharge in, in less than a second. Yeah. But uh, that was a very good explanation of solid state. I was actually unaware of, of sort of what was behind that technology. Yeah. And they haven't officially announced those things. Right. But this is from talking with people in the industry. And in fact, you know, Maxwell's a San Diego company. So I've met people that have worked there in the past and there's, you know, a lot of rumors, a lot of conjecture, but basically when you see a lot of clues and signs pointing in the same direction, you know, it gives you a hint that something like that is probably in the work. So, yeah. so we'll see, I would not be shocked at the battery investor day, whenever that happens, because they announced that a while ago on Twitter, that we'll probably get some major stuff and that will be another ground shaking yeah. moment thing. So, and, and I think that actually would lead better to the future of Tesla. I have all this other theory on, on where Tesla should go versus where they're kind of currently pointed in. Did you think there was going to be a, a one more thing? They were going to reveal the, the Plaid Model S or show a redesigned interior for the S and the X sort of as Q4 is sort of winding up and then down. I was expecting that personally. And that, that was just based on hope. Yeah, no, same thing. And yeah, standing with there with the guys that I knew that were working on the presentation, I'm like, am I going to see a Model S today? They're like, no, you're not. I'm like, uh. but <laughs> they did say, okay, so to that point, this is a tri-motor design with 500 miles of range. We've yeah. not... I mean, the Roadster is reportedly getting that. So, yeah, this car's way heavier than the Roadster is. So, where is the Model S going to be? It, you know, in between, if, when it gets its tri motor design, mm -hmm. it's going to be 500 miles of range, maybe. I mean, maybe more. I don't know, like five, between five and six. Yeah. So, I'm really looking forward to that. When that comes out, I am ordering that immediately. In fact, if they were, if they had unveiled that, I would have ordered it right then and there. <laughs> yeah, I would have too. I mean, and I would have just. Or gone my, my three and then that would have been my car. Can I ask a question to you guys? Because you guys are both tech heads and you know this stuff because you've been in it for so long real quick. For sure. And I chatted with Marquez about this recently as well, but he's, you know, much younger. <laughs> so so you guys, I appreciate, you know, we're all kind of been around tech for a long time. Do you, you remember Qualcomm actually made phones? Yes. Right? There was a time when they were making phones as the like guys pushing cell phones. Now that's a joke, right? Like I think a lot of young people out there, you know, people that maybe like tech products don't even know who Qualcomm is, right? Like we all do. <laughs> that's and, true. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? But like the general public probably doesn't even know who they are, but some of their stuff is in probably what? 90 plus percent of smartphones in the world. Yeah. Like yeah. some in, insane percentage, right? What if Tesla goes this route? What if Tesla, because delivering and servicing and just being a car company yeah. is a different skill than building powertrains and motors and battery packs. Oh, and by the way, being a software company, making an OS to power this whole thing. So I wonder if Tesla maybe evolves a little bit, kind of how Qualcomm did, or maybe Google does how like, yeah, they make the Pixel and that's a phone, but you know, it's not for everyone, but they make Android and there's what thousands of probably different Android models out there. Right. So I wonder, I mean, what do you guys think? Is that a good path for Tesla? I mean, less throwing of balls at the window and more just batteries and goodness. I guess I would say, yes, that would be a better move in my opinion, but it always seems like, and I think Elon even mentioned this one time, it seems like everything that all of the companies that he works on, whether it's Tesla whether it's the boring company, all of it points to Mars. All of it points to we're basically beta testing everything here on Earth. We're making cool products. We're selling cool stuff. But this is all with one goal in mind. Hmm. And like when you look at the truck, I think that he even said afterwards, like this is the official truck of Mars. It's going to be a pressurized version for Mars. Like everything that he does, electricity, boring tunnels, all that. SpaceX, obviously, hmm. is to help us become an interplanetary species. And so I think... What you just talked about would be great for a typical company here on Earth, but for a company that's trying to get <laughs> us to Mars, I think he's more on the right path there as long as they don't run out of money. I kind of stand in the middle. I think if you want to say what's the easiest path to financial sustainability, then I think what you described is, is the easiest way forward for to financial success. I don't think that's Tesla's goal. I think if, if you were to say where do they deviate or go different, I think an acquisition probably would make more sense. Mm. But I don't think what you described, you know, Tesla selling powertrains is that far fetched either. I think they could still sell the powertrains and also still make the cars mm -hmm. or license out. You know, they, they're their patents are obviously widely available. 
if they're going to stand behind their mission of sort of speeding up the adoption of, of sustainable mobility, then letting other manufacturers sort of use those powertrains, and I think more importantly, use their software mm -hmm. could be significant. And that's where we've seen other companies lag behind. We've seen electric cars by Jaguar and Audi, and they always do a couple things really well, like a Tesla, right. and then they're behind on one thing, you know, and usually it's software. Right. So if you can see a car manufacturer that could sort of take that over, I think it would make a lot of sense. I think your point is is very well taken. I think it would definitely be a lot easier path for them. I think they would. I mean, it would be a trillion dollar company probably within a matter of a decade. Yeah, and, and the way I look at it, you know, in the past week, I've got to drive the Porsche Taycan for a day. I got to ride in the Mach E, and you know, obviously, I'm driving Tesla every day, so I've had a good sense of like kind of the most recent ones. And I mean, what people really struggle with, uh, yeah, software is one. Ford, actually, I was kind of impressed with with the UI. I mean, I wouldn't say it was great, but for Ford, I was really impressed. But the batteries, like look at the look at the Mercedes EQC, look at the Audi e-tron, look at the Jaguar I-Pace. Obviously, they make great cars and they know how to make really fine finishings and stuff like that. But the range and the power, I mean, it's just, it's not even a 2012 Model S. And so I'm just going, man, let Mercedes, let Audi, let Volkswagen do that. No one has a gigafactory. You're the only guys with this giant, giant gigafactory. And yeah, go ahead and make the cars and, you know, push those limits, like show what's possible. I think, you know, that's the, the Google analogy, right? The Pixel has its quirks and you guys are obviously more versed in that than I am. It's not for everyone, but it shows like some really unique, cool things about them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that inspires, you know, Samsung to take some lessons for that or OnePlus or whomever. Yeah, I think both can exist, but I think it would be, I mean, I don't know, like, like maybe this is just me thinking, yeah, I want this to be a sustainable business. I don't want this just to be crazy cyber trucks, you know? But yeah, I think there's a, there's some interesting paths ahead here. And I'm really curious to follow along and see just, just how it goes. Yeah, I very much agree. All right. Perfect. Ben, thank you so much for joining us this week here on Geared Up. Yeah. Huge thank you. And again, if you want to hear more from Ben, if you're into electric cars or the future, Teslanomics or Teslanomics, but it is with an S <laughs> um, on YouTube, look him up. And after the break, I will be sitting down with Samsung's Jim Elliott to talk about the latest Exynos chips that we're going to see in the next round of Samsung's flagship devices, talk about their new 5G modem and what the future of interconnected devices is going to look like with 5G, autonomous driving, etc. It's coming up next on Geared Up. During the recent Samsung Tech Day in San Jose, California, I had the opportunity to sit down with Jim Elliott, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Samsung Semiconductor. We talked about how Samsung technology is ushering in the future of smartphones, autonomous driving, super fast 5G wireless networks, fast memory, and more. Now, I won't spoil the interview, but it's clear that we're on the cusp of some major technological advancements that will drive forward a new age of innovation, similar to what we saw when 4G enabled us to carry devices in our pockets that let us order cars right to our precise location, stream music and videos no matter where we are, and the ability to post content to social networks for anyone to read. So the question is, what's next? Here's my interview with Jim Elliott to answer that question. What's going on, guys? Andrew Edwards here at Samsung Tech Day 2019 with the man right here, Jim Elliott. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. This is fantastic. A lot of excitement here in the air. Powering innovation, as it says on your shirt. Yes. Before we get started talking about what Tech Day is and all the announcements, sure. could you tell people who you are? Who is Jim Elliott? So uh, I run memory sales and marketing here at uh, DSA in, uh, in North America. So I have North America responsibilities for all of our memory products, uh, sales and marketing. So really excited to be hosting our, our Tech yeah. Day uh, 2019 this year. Awesome. All right. So as we said, big day for Samsung. Tell me about some of the bigger announcements the more exciting things that have gone down here today. So we've got about a handful of announcements we're gonna be covering today that I'll talk about our theme today, which is around powering innovation. Okay. So we have a couple on the DRAM side of the fence, a couple on the NAND side of the fence, and a couple things around SSD as well. And it's all about what we can do to continue to allow our customers and the overall technology industry right. to continue to innovate so all these tech gadgets that the rest of us all take for granted can continue to uh, evolve and, and improve. So it was a few years ago that people said four gigabytes and even six gigabytes were overkill for smartphones. And today we're seeing that handheld devices are more than capable of putting extra RAM to good use. Your tech day announcements are saying you can bring over 10 gigabytes of RAM to mobile devices. 
What are some practical use cases you foresee for adding all this power into a handheld device like a smartphone? Yeah, so actually we're announcing a 12 gigabyte UMCP device today that goes into a smartphone, for example, mm -hmm. and really think about it as a, an AI capable smartphone. Okay. So you're bringing lots and lots of compute right to the phone, and you're gonna be able to do a lot of things that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's where this is so interesting because we're creating this ecosystem where people can come along and develop the next killer app, the next software app, the next software program, or the next use case that's able to satiate all that compute uh, power that's going to reside in, in, in your phone of the future. Okay, so can you give me an example? So let's just say you have a, a mobile device, 12 gigabytes in your hand. Mm -hmm. Like you're not using that to send out your, your next tweet, right? You're not using that to send out an Instagram photo. What are some practical use cases of having all that power in your hand? So it could be having a lot of things going on at the same time. Maybe you're a mobile gamer. Maybe okay. you want to stream 4K video on a new 5G network or it's the confluence of all these things that you want to do at the same time. And you think about that compute power of what you're having on a phone used to be like what you had on a PC just right. a few years ago. So think about now how all the capabilities that your PC has being able to do that from your phone. So the move to 4G about eight years ago mm -hmm. enabled a bunch of new things. That's things right. like Instagram, things like Uber, you know, things like Spotify. Things that, they're not just apps, they're not just services, they're things that actually change the culture here in America. What do you see 5G doing for us that we can't even imagine today? That's a great question. I, I think, first of all, we really we don't know what we don't know. Right. Because when 4G, uh, the advancement hit, video streaming was in its infancy. Yes. And now Netflix is pretty much ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So now as we go into more of a, a 5G with the additional bandwidth that that allows, I think that's going to enable even 4K or even 8K video streams. But the beauty of this is as the hardware industry innovates and we innovate at the silicon level, and we have more bandwidth available, it's gonna be really interesting to see what all the new business models and the new use cases start to pop up because, again, I think that's what's so exciting to me about this industry is if we can fuel some of these technology advances, right. we can then create these sort of lifestyle changes for things that nobody even knew of 10 years ago, yeah. and now people just kind of take them for granted. Okay, do you have any guesses as to what I'm trying to think like, in the, it's, like you said, it's hard to, you don't yeah, know what you don't sure, know. Sure, sure. But I feel like you know more than I do. Okay. I think you have something in the labs or you know, you guys, you things, guys yeah. see some stuff that I don't see yet. Anything you can share? So from a mobile standpoint, 5G is all gonna be about uh, high def video streaming. But the other big thing that 5G unlocks is autonomous driving. Okay. And so autonomous driving has to have that 5G capability for that speed, that reliability, mm -hmm. the, the bandwidth, the latency and everything. And then you get the vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. So think about how like you can send an email across the country with a large email right. attachment to it, and yet this traffic light isn't talking to that traffic light, and one's red and one's green. Right. You bring 5G into the picture, and it creates that entire ecosystem we call V to X, so vehicle to everything, mm -hmm. and the stoplights are talking to each other, the cars are talking to each other, and there's a sort of overall awareness of, of what's happening around you, I think that 5G will uh, unfold or enable in the next five or 10 years. Wow, it's gonna nice. be really remarkable. I also saw that Samsung announced the world's first 12 layer 3D TSV memory stacking process. How important is this for future applications such as AI and high performance computing? So we announced this new uh, 3D TSV 12 stack package, mm -hmm. which is basically for our HBM, we call that high bandwidth memory. Okay. And that is memory that is specifically made for AI and HPC, artificial intelligence, and then high performance computing applications. So think of this as going into, say, a, a media and entertainment vertical, mm -hmm. where something that used to take, you know, if you were rendering some special effects and you wanted to create a virtual environment that would take weeks or days, sure. now a lot of that can be done in real time with this kind of memory bandwidth that's available, and we put it very close to the CPU. So I think that is gonna allow us to have much, much more capabilities, or the industry to have much more capabilities from both an AI and high performance uh, computing standpoint. Everyone talks about the amount of data that people consume from video streaming to social media content to even text messages and the pace of consumption is unstoppable. Could you break this down for me? What does one second of data look like today? And how is Samsung's technology playing in this unyielding data storm? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So if you look at one second in 2019, it's over a thousand hours of Netflix being streamed. So think of the amount of the storage needs where that has to be stored on a server, right. the amount of bandwidth required to get that out to mm -hmm. a, an end device, be it a tablet or a phone or, or a PC, 
and the amount of just capability that the industry yeah. has put in place to be able to, to enable that. And I think what's happening now is the explosion of data is now becoming so advanced. I mean, there's more than 20 billion connected devices that you've heard this new phenomenon called edge computing. Yes. So a lot of the, the uh, what's happening is that compute horsepower has to be brought closer to the data, and we, that's what we call that edge computing. So now there's so much data being generated, it's actually too expensive to move it to a centralized cloud. And so we're gonna see a bigger build out at the edge. And I think Samsung is gonna play at the forefront of the memory content, both mm -hmm. at the device level, but then also in those edge computing devices that are allowing that, that data flow to go back and forth. With all the data that's generated, people uploading video, people downloading video, companies putting, everything's on the cloud now. How do you keep up with the storage requirements? Like all this video that's being generated, always being uploaded. We have these data centers everywhere. Are they just constantly like, are people paid to just rush and just put hard drives in and just keep up with this? Or how, how does this work? I don't even know. I don't know, you tell me. So that's a great question. So again, in, in the data center uh, area or just in storage in general, yeah. there's a couple different areas. So there's what we call a, a hot data area. So this is like a brand new post from a famous person. Like okay. if, if Beyonce uploads a video, it's gonna get yep. lots and lots and lots of hits. That's gonna go into a solid state drive. Okay. So that's gonna be flash-based, memory-based storage, because it's gonna have lots and lots and lots of hits. Right. Me, on the other hand, with my you know, not so many Facebook <laughs> followers, if I post a picture on that, very quickly it'll go into what's called cold storage. So it's kind of being archived. Okay. So that's a different dynamic. And so what the storage industry has been very good at is sort of tiering the data set so that hot data and cold data can be sort of separated. The hot data can be monetized mm -hmm. because it's happening in real time right. and you can sort of tune products or advertisements based on people's location and what they're doing. Right. Yes. Whereas cold data is more for archival purposes. But ultimately everything that's in hot data today potentially can migrate to cold data in the future. Let's switch topics and talk about artificial intelligence. We've already seen tremendous applications for AI even using it to help make better beer. What's Samsung doing to drive innovation and take AI to the next level? So a lot of the products we make are very central to AI because AI requires a lot of compute, a lot of horsepower there. And so I think some of the innovations that we're gonna be talking about today on the DRAM side in terms of more capacity, more bandwidth, some of the innovations we're gonna be talking about on the HBM or high bandwidth memory side in terms of having greater stacks, is going to enable even more uh, uses for AI in the future. Everything we're talking about today points to a more integrated future where devices are smarter, they can talk to each other, and even make decisions based on data. 5G, artificial intelligence, and smaller, more powerful chips all coming together, which is kind of the point That's of right, this event here, right? That's my wrap up. Hold on, give me a glimpse into the future of everyday life for the average consumer once all of this matures in a few years. What does the day look like? I got you, you know, it's, it's really interesting. If you think about where the intelligence of the devices that we all use and take for granted every day, mm -hmm. I think over time they're gonna get better and better and better at predicting what you need okay. and giving you those suggestions or ideas even before you know what you need. So for example, it's, it's the stoplight example, it's the when you yes. pull your car up into the driveway, the lights come on. You don't even have to think about that stuff. All your preferences are saved. Everything is context-based. So the ads are gonna be relevant to you based on where you are, what your preferences are, what your personal history is. Mm -hmm. I think there's gonna be much more, I would say, customization down to the individual level. And you think about 5G, I mean, you're talking about location specific to within one meter. Wow. So everything's gonna know where everything else is, and I think everything is just gonna fit and then hopefully make our everyday lives much more uh, convenient and, uh, and smoother. Obviously, when it comes to a lot of what we've discussed today, lots of companies are looking to innovate in this space in their own way. A lot of them in different individual areas. Samsung is kind of innovating across the board, mm -hmm. right? How would you say Samsung is differentiating the market with its approach? Really, the fundamental area that, that, that Samsung has been able to differentiate ourselves within the semiconductor and especially in the memory space is, is number one is technology leadership. We're always the first to market with a new technology be it the, the greatest capacity of, of a new SSD or solid state drive or the fastest DRAM or the, the most amount of stacks for HBM or high bandwidth memory. And the second uh, front to that is the breadth of product. We really have an unparalleled breadth of product for every single vertical, every single application. We have a memory solution that is really custom 
tuned and custom designed for each of those. And that's really what allows us to, to, to power all this innovation. And, and that's why that's the theme of our, of our tech day today. Awesome, awesome. Well, Jim, thank you so much. Thank Taking you. Taking some time to talk to us about this, about these announcements. Very exciting. The future looks bright and amazing, especially for those of us who love tech. So thanks a lot. Hey, thank you so we much. We appreciate nice it. And that is it for this edition of Geared Up. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can catch John and I on YouTube. I'm at youtube.com slash gear live. And John is at youtube.com slash John for Lakers. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on all the latest tech. Speaking of subscribing, you can subscribe to Geared Up in your favorite podcast app. If you haven't done so already, just search Geared Up. That's two words, not one in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcast, or really wherever you choose to listen. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Geared Up is a Gear Live podcast, and you can see more from us at GearLive.com. Thank you so much for listening. For John Rettinger, I'm Andrew Edwards, and we'll catch you in the next episode.